30th, that last Monday of <laughs> December. Is there a motion on those minutes, please? Move to approve the minutes of December 30th, 2019. Second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. As opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Abstention. So noted. Our minutes are approved. Immediately into the public hearings for this evening, uh, just by way of background for anyone who is unfamiliar with the process, as each application is announced from the podium, we would ask that the applicant or the representative come forward to the podium, provide your name and address for the record, and then a brief summary of the application. Following any questions from the commission members, we will offer an opportunity to the members of the public to speak in favor of each application, and then we will offer a similar opportunity for the members of the public who wish to speak in opposition to the application. Where there are comments made in opposition, we will encourage the applicant to return to the podium to address those comments made in opposition. So with that, let us begin. And Heather, would you please introduce our first application? Sure. Thank you. Good, good evening, Commission members and Mr. Kulik. Tonight's first hearing is AS1914A. This is an appeal to a signed waiver. Uh, to install four wall signs at 300 South State Street. Bar Clark Place LLC is the owner and uh, it lies within a central business district office and service zoning district. This was held open from last time on December 30th of 2019. I will also call to your attention another item on the agenda which um, could be considered a companion piece. It's a different application. It's a project site review for um, to install roof lighting on the perimeter of the roof of this building in which the sign uh, appeal, sign waiver appeal is being considered. This is PR 2020 <coughs> and all the other information is the same. So um, because we have had the project site review in our office and you were considering this appeal, uh, we brought it um, forward to your for your consideration. It's uh, PR 2002. Did I what did I say? 2020. 2020. Just for the record. 2002. Okay, thank you. And Madam Legal Counsel, just for clarification, uh, since these are the same location, same applicant, it I think makes sense to hear both pieces together. Yes. And separate them when it comes time for action. Yeah, and that is appropriate. And again, the the second is new business, so a public hearing isn't needed for that. But it's certainly appropriate to hear them both at the same time. Okay. Thank you. So, if the applicant is here, would you please come forward and uh, continue with the first one? But it might be a little bit more efficient for you if you want to address the other items in the second one concerning the lighting while you're at the podium. Uh, my preference would be to start with the sign, if that's okay, if that's all right with the board. Um, my, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak in front of you tonight. My name is Brody Smith. I'm an attorney at Bon Shinnikin King. Also here um, with our team from Haler Fry and Coon is Mr. Fryer, uh, who's going to give you some background. There were some questions before concerning the firefighters park, and he's going to talk about that a little bit. And then also we have Greg Fischel from Allied Sign who's here to answer questions about the signs. So uh, just a brief uh, overview and if it's all right, um, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll approach and give you my uh, summary of my C comments. So you certainly, can certainly. So the property is located at 300 Salina Street in the downtown neighborhood of Syracuse. Um, it's on approximately an acre. 
The building is approximately 100 feet tall. It was constructed in 1983. Haler, Fry, and Kuhn recently re relocated its headquarters to that building. Um, that brought 130 jobs downtown. The uh, Haler, Fry, and Kuhn uh, uh, occupies approximately 40,000 square feet of the building on the top floor. Um, the top floors. It, it also uh, is, is worth noting, I know we talked about last time, that um, though it is a multi-tenant building, due to the terms of the lease, uh, Haler, Fry, and Kuhn would be the only entity, the only tenant entitled to put signage across the top of the building. So we're asking for signage on top of the building, it would be the only, the only signage. So um, I will, I will uh, stop there and let Mr. Fryer talk a little bit about the, the Fireman's Park, and then I'll jump into the factors, and then we'll finish with uh, making Mr. Fischel available to you to answer any questions about the signs themselves. Thank you, Brody. Jim Fryer, CEO, Hale Fryer & Kuhn, 300 South State Street, Syracuse. These are photographs of Mr. Fryer. So the benefit of the, the whole board here tonight, I'll just give you a little quick history and also um, talk about uh, our founder. We were founded in 1928. Haler is an insurance and risk management agency. Haler Fryer & Kuhn is. Founded in 1928 by Barney Haler. And what Brody just handed out to you has to do with the fireman's park across the street. And I want to share with you that Barney Haler's father was a district fire chief for the district of Syracuse. He died at a young age of 48 years old. And what kept our firm going back in 1928, you understand the, the economics, our country at that time, was that Barney Haler was able to call on firemen and police, which were one of the few employed people in the city of Syracuse. That kept our agency alive start a business in 1928. And so we will be very respectful of that park across the street. What we're sharing with you is actually a boardroom that we have in our office. We call it the Fireman's Memorial. That's the front door, the first page there. And then we've taken fireman memorabilia that we had, pictures, helmets, things of that nature, and just respectfully displayed them in our conference room. It's important to us because it drives the history of where Haler Fire and Coon began. So we began in 1928 with one person. Where are we today? Today we have 185 employee owners. Which the employees of Haler, Fryer & Kuhn Haler, Fryer & Kuhn. It's a very unique, called an ESOP. We've been an ESOP for 20 years. And what I will assure you, we will be good stewards within the city. We've been in the city of Syracuse since 1928, 92 years. Where are we ranked today? We're ranked one of the top 100 insurance agencies in the country based on size. We have 185 employees. We have six offices across the state. We do business across the country, and we also do business internationally. We have a lot of specialty programs, but it all goes back to risk management and insurance. And those are just some dynamics of Hale, Fryer & Kuhn to say that, and I made this comment before, to be located in Syracuse, New York, and be a top 100 insurance firm in the country. And we're proud to say that. We're here to stay. This is where our corporate offices will be and are today. We are excited to move, as, as Brody said, 130 employee owners downtown Syracuse. It's a vibrant community, and, and we're happy to be part of that fabric. I will assure you again that we're good stewards in the community. You might be familiar with our firm. Over the many years, a lot of good people built a great foundation for our company. And that pretty much is my elevator speech, if you want to call it that. Any questions, comments? Great, thank you. So, I'll jump right into the factors from the statute, and I'll try not to be repetitive since I know that um, you heard this at the last meeting. But I'll, I'll try to highlight some additional uh, facts that, um, or maybe different ways of thinking it from our last conversation. Uh, beginning on page two of my comments, there's. Uh, that begins the factors for the analysis of the waiver criteria. Letter A is that the proposed signs are not in conflict with general prohibitions contained in Article 5 of the law. The proposed signs in this case do not violate any of the general prohibitions found in Part C, Section 6, Article 5 of the law. This factor doesn't apply in this particular case. Letter B is the first applicable waiver criteria and it asks whether the proposed signs will not have an adverse impact on the character and integrity of any land use having a unique cultural, historic, geographical, or architectural, something of architectural significance. 
It has been, um, we've received comments from the Syracuse Landmark Preservation Committee that I'd like to address. They specifically deal with any impacts that the installation of this sign would have on Firefighters Park, which is across the uh, street from the building, located to the east on, on State Street. Fayette Park was renamed Firefighters Memorial Park in 1972, according to the Syracuse Parks Department. Um, it states on the web page that early 20th century residents would not recognize the park or its surroundings if they visited the site today. Most of the private family residences are gone. Originally designed with a spring slash summer theme, this garden-esque landscape was redesigned to a more formal style in the early 1990s, in early 1900s, I should say. And then in 1972, they changed the name and installed the um, aspects of the park which are familiar to us today that honor firefighters. The building across the street, the building which is the subject of this application, was constructed in 1983. So that's 11 years after the park was renamed and reconfigured to be the Firefighters Memorial Park. I should note that the building that they built across the street 11 years later is 100 feet tall and I'm asking for a sign that is 43 inches tall. And so that's a pretty big change to the historic landscape. The zoning administrator previously issued a sign waiver for the, a previous tenant of the building on March 22, 2006, allowing for two wall signs totaling 318 square feet. Those two signs were later installed and remained on the building um, for some time, for, 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 for many years. I believe approximately 10 years, though I, I, I'm not sure the exact number of years it was there. On October 23, 2019, the Zoning Administrator again issued an approval for the same waiver that was previously allowed. That waiver would allow the applicant to install two signs, and as we, we gave you schematics at the last meeting, what, that, what the sign would look like under the, under the old waiver, and the, the letters are only 39 inches tall um, under, under the square footage allowed from that waiver, and looked kind of small and odd, and that's why we're here asking for a larger, a larger waiver. And, and that would be the, uh, the sign that faces the park. On the next page, I provided you a view of, of the building from the park. And one of the great things about this park is that it's heavily um, wooded. And you, you obviously can't see the top of the building from any point in the park because of the prevalence of the trees there. And I think we discussed at the last meeting, um, for example, when they have that wonderful uh, charity event where people uh, rappel down this building, they have to close State Street in front of it because you can't, you can't see them rappel from the park. They have to line people up in State Street so you, you can actually see the event. So the park took its current form in 1972. When the park was created, the building did not exist. The addition of the 100-foot building in 1983 significantly altered the historic landscape of 1972 Firefighters Park. In 2006, the, sign, the city allowed a sign to be installed on the top of the building, and it was. In 2019, the zoning administrator again decided that uh, a, a waiver of some kind was appropriate, and um, the waiver would have resulted in letters that are 39 inches tall. Um, we are asking that we're, to be allowed a larger waiver to allow the letters on the side facing the park to be 43 inches tall. It should be noted that the Landmark Preservation Board did not have the benefit of the simulations that have been provided to this board when they made their determination of whether scale and placement of the signs are appropriate. We believe from the drawings that we've provided to you that, this, that the scale and placement of the signs in the context of the architecture um, and in the context of the area is appropriate and would not damage the park. Again, we're asking to go from 39 to 43 inches. We're asking for four additional inches. I don't think that is going to significantly alter the historic significance of the park when, in all fairness, a 100-foot building was, was built there 11 years after the park and there was, no, there was no such finding from the preservation board then. Letter C is the next waiver criteria and it asks whether the proposed signs will not adversely affect the character of districts in close proximity proximity within which such signs would be prohibited. And that was one of the true pleasures of preparing this application was walking around downtown Syracuse and observing the signs. The signs give us a sense of place. They give us a sense of uh, a, a bit of a badge of success in, in looking at the, the rehabilitation of our, down, of our downtown and the introduction of good jobs, sophisticated companies, and you know, the, 
I've pictured some of them in this table to show you what some of these other signs that are in close proximity um, look like. There's the AXA sign. The letters there are 16.6 feet tall. That's obviously a very different thing, but a very large sign. The, it was mentioned in the last meeting, the Parkview Hotel, and we wondered how tall the letters were there. They are 42 inches tall at the Parkview Hotel. Bon Shinnick and King and Chase have, both have signage on, the, on one Lincoln Center. The uh, Bond sign is 72 inches tall, the letters in Bond. Barclay Damon has, letters, has signs on four sides of that building. Those letters are 60 inches tall. Those, those are the signs where I could get specific dimensions from, from different sources. Specifically, Allied Sign can show you schematics of the, those signs in more detail if that's necessary. But I also provided to you some additional photographs um, uh, that, that, uh, you know, that I located of other signs just to show you context in the area, even though I don't know the exact dimensions of those letters. That includes the Verizon sign, which is right across the street and also faces the, the Fireman's Park. It's a very large sign. Upstate is visible from the other side of the other side of the park, not from our side. It's that, that's on the on the east. And the Crown Plaza is nearby with a very large sign on the roof. MNC Bank, as you know, is visible just from Hanover Square, um, and you know, with a large sign facing this direction as well. Letter D asks whether the proposed signs will hide or obstruct any other sign. They will not. Uh, they're flush to the building. Letter E asks whether the proposed signs are otherwise compatible with the context of its visual and physical environment within the district in which the signs are proposed. I believe that the, the context that we've given um, is also applicable to answer this question in the sense that we are in downtown Syracuse. Uh, the zoning has been provided at Central Business District Office and Service. The neighboring zones, uh, the only different neighboring zone is also Central Business District Office and Service restricted. Uh, and this, uh, this is the area that's set aside for insurance and accounting firms and law firms and banks and accounting institutions. If you look out the window, you can see some of these signs. And um, that's, that's exactly what we propose to do. To the extent that there's any question whether these signs are appropriate, I think, I think they are. Obviously, waivers have been granted for all these other buildings in the sense that it's, it's, it's appropriate to direct people to the location of these buildings so they, so they can find them. It's the same in all these different contexts. All these businesses, whether they're insurance or a law firm, have significant needs in that regard. And also, I think it's worth noting that in the past, a waiver was granted on this specific building for a law firm. Now we're an insurance firm. But in a sense, um, and Mr. Fryer gave comments about this at our last meeting, that they have thousands of customers at Haler Fry and Kuhn, many of whom um, visit, visit the office, though not on a daily basis, you know, over the period of their being a customer with Haler Fry and Kuhn, either in connection with um, obtaining coverage or w uh, with uh, claims. So the, um, the appropriateness and the context, I think, is all clear. And then the final, the final uh, waiver criteria is compliance with applicable regulations will not allow the minimum information deemed essential to inform the public as to the nature, identification, and or availability of the person, product, or service, or activity that the sign is referring to. In the absence of a waiver, Haler would suffer practical difficulties and would be denied an opportunity to inform the public as to its location not only in the building, but also the fact that it's moved to downtown Syracuse. Um, after having its headquarters outside of Syracuse for many years, they're proud to be back in Syracuse where they began and would like the public to know that. They would like their customers to be able to find them. Haler is one of the top 100 independently owned insurance agencies in the United States. It has thousands of customers, many of whom will need to visit the building at one time or another. In conclusion, the zoning administrator has already determined that a sign is appropriate considering the above reference factors. Remember, a waiver was granted. Our appeal is that we'd like a sign that's a little bit bigger. Um, so in the sense that the waiver was granted in 2019, a waiver was also granted in 2006. Thus, the question before the board is one of scale and uh, rather than appropriateness of there being a sign at all. The applicant is asking for permission to install signs with letters 43 inches tall on the east side of the building and 48 inches tall on the west and south side of the building as depicted in the drawings that we've provided to you. 
The application should be granted because the proposed letter heights are needed to fit within the architectural scale and context of the building and to ensure that the sign serves its purpose in directing the public to the presence of this new business downtown. And Greg, if you come up with me, I just want to just briefly walk you through these drawings. This is the sign that we're, we're proposing uh, for the the, um, Excuse me. East side facing the front. You bring the microphone with you because it's being oh, sure. it's being recorded. And um, Greg, could you state your name for the record too and address? Greg Fischel, Allied Sign Company, Syracuse, New York. So th this is the sign that you would you would see from the park. And so the letters here are 43 inches tall. They're centered um, in, in above the front door of the building, and. Um, We've, our, when we initially applied, they were 55 inches tall and there were capital and lowercase letters. In order to make them smaller, we, we made it caps and made them 43 inches. Um, the, the sign waiver, if you look at the square footage, would allow 39. And we showed you the picture before. It's very small and kind of oddly centered in that way. So we think this would be a better solution. And it, it's certainly compromised from what we applied to before, but uh, Haler Fry and Kuhn would be very happy with this sign, and they certainly want to work with the city and get the right the right solution. You might note, just you know, for context, there's the Barclay sign and the Chase sign in the background, and you can see, I think you can see the M and C sign back there. The um, this would be the uh, facing west, right, Greg? And so again, these. I'm sorry, South. I apologize. You can see Verizon in the background, of City Hall. So this is this is facing south. Um, this sign's larger, and the reason that it's larger is to fit is to fit the the architecture. Is to fit is to fit that space, that blank brick space there, and uh, and that that would face south. And then finally, this is the sign that would face to the west. Um, and, and again. Same explanation, 48, 48 inches tall, uh, caps, um, and I want to open up the, the floor to any questions from the board, if you have any questions for me or for Greg. Okay, thank you. Are there questions for any team members? So you're looking for signs on three sides. Pardon me? You're looking for signs on three sides. Yes, ma'am, three sides, yep. So you were granted a waiver by the zoning administrator to have two signs, so it's not just a matter of scale. You actually want more signs. That's, That's correct. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Further questions? All right, well, since it's a continuation from our last conversation, again, we appreciate that you incorporated some of our questions into your presentation tonight. We appreciate that. Um, the references to the other signs their proximity to this building, their scale, to the buildings that they're on. Because I know I had questions for you before about the upstate sign, the Park View uh, sign, the Crown Plaza. Um, so height of the building, scale of the sign, the height of the building, those things were important to us. And that this is an appeal of the zoning administrator's decision is something that's important. It's another factor we crunch into the equation. But because it's a multi-part conversation and we've got commission members here who weren't here last time, we want to be sure the record is full of all the rationale behind our, our review. Um, just asking the chair, we did say we would consider the part of this which is not, he said he wanted to do his presentation first on this. Are you gonna return or are you gonna incorporate now the second part of it? Uh, I'd like to keep the two separate if I could. You would? Yeah. Okay, and my questions are answered, thank you. No, I, I think I have pretty firm understanding. Of this. I, I guess um, I guess the one point that I would make is that your comment about whether or not this is visible from the park is a fair one, but it's probably a comment you could make about all the signs, given the density of building construction in the area. That virtually the only place you're really going to see these signs from the elevated highway, which is going away so it's I guess it calls to question just how visible any of these would be from ground level um, that and again the fact that you're asking for more in number not just the scale of the letters themselves and therefore the square footage total because um, right now there are only two signs on the building 
there are not three wall signs, or there were, I'm sorry, were. Well, Previously, there, there were two, two wall signs approved there, yeah, for a previous tenant, correct? Okay, I just want to make sure that, that the history of that is correct. Okay. And I think that's a fair question. And I, um, uh, you didn't have the benefit of looking at these pictures from the last meeting. And if I may, I'll, I'll hand you this, this packet. I went around with my, I went around walking around with my cell phone and sort of looked at to see what the signs look like from street level. And the, you can see, you can see from them. A lot of these are not very professional because I took them with my picture. Some of them are from Google Maps, obviously. Um, but the. Um, uh, I do think that they're helpful. Um, this one, the, the only thing I could say uh, is that this one would be no more or less helpful than all the other ones. So if the, the other waivers are granted, then you know this would be in the same boat. Also in the packet that I just provided to you, those larger uh, scale drawings in the back, this will give you context kind of for the, the sweep of the application. You see what the 55 inch sign would have looked like. And then the second page I think is important. This one shows you what a 39-inch sign would look like, and we think it's out of scale with the architecture, and that's one of the reasons we're asking to make it a little bit bigger. So these were these were all photographs that were handed out at the last meeting and are part of the record. And you can keep that. I have plenty of copies. Yeah. Thank you. If one was to rank the three sides of the building where signs are proposed, what would be the order of priority you would give to the front of the building, the south, and the western elevations? Um, well, well the, east, the east is the top priority, clearly. And in our proposal, we, for, as opposed to our initial application, we removed the north. And so you're asking me if, if we only got two, would we prefer to have the south or the west? Is that what you're asking? I have to ask my client that. <laughs> The answer, the answer is west, and, and, and one, of the, one of the context questions about you know how many sides there should be signs on. I think, you know, the when you read the statute, it it really f is key to frontage, right? So this building, this building has, and, and there's some disagreement. And I, I understand why uh, between us and the, the zoning administrator. We we maintain this as frontage on three sides on State Street, and then on. Um, uh, help me, Washington, Fayette. I'm sorry, Fayette, and um, and then, but where there's some dispute is whether there's frontage on Onondaga because it's not a 90 degree angle; it's a 45 degree angle. Now we're not asking to have the sign go on the north side. We think that it's less useful there. We think that it could be, considering that the building is being redeveloped for residential, you know, the better policy from our point of view would be east, west, south facing commercial world, not somebody's apartment. Um, so that's how we came up with that solution. Other questions? All set. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much. Are there individuals who would like to speak in favor of this application? If so, please come forward. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to the application, please come forward. So we have no uh, further speakers this evening. <clears throat> uh, presentation. I think we're in a position to close this public hearing and move to our next application. The next public hearing is SP 2001. This is a special permit for a restaurant at 919 East Genesee Street, B V S H S S F. Syracuse LLC is the owner, and Jang Ju is the applicant. And this property lies within a business class A zoning district. The applicant is here, please come forward, <clears throat> or the representative. Um, you could 
go to the podium and state your name for the record? Is okay. this your application? Yes. Okay. So if you <clears throat> just provide your name and address for the record, and then give us a little summary of what your proposal entails, please. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Kyu Jiang, and uh, my address is 919 East Genesis Street, Syracuse, New York. And we're going to do a uh, Thai bubble tea restaurant, okay? Uh, have uh, bubble tea and uh, sushi and ramen, okay? Almost like uh, Japanese food. And that's a synopsis of what your project is all about, right? Okay. Did um, staff was the applicant provided with a copy of the staff report in terms of the waivers that the application would entail? <coughs> In addition to the summary you already gave us, <clears throat> the application would require a waiver from existing city regulations um, pertaining to these kinds of facilities. I think there are five, five altogether uh, of these so-called waivers, waiving certain provisions of the regulations. Uh, in order for the commission to consider the possibility of making these waivers, we would ask you to provide a rationale or a reason on each of these instances uh, why that waiver is needed. Now, I don't know if you might have a copy of that with you, or could we provide one? Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> So where each of those um, points indicates that a waiver is needed, could you provide us um, the reason why it's needed in your view so that we can take that into account? I, my English is no good, so. I'm sorry. English problem. <laughs> Found this. Um, Can I make a speak phone to talk to uh, my partner and uh, certainly, and sh sh he have a nice English so he can answer you more question about it. Okay. Uh, we can hold this uh, to move on to the next case. And okay, that sounds. And they'll give you time to contact your partner and if he can join us, he or she can join us. That would be great. Uh, but we'll move on and we'll come back to you later and check in with you to see if. Okay. We've got someone else to can okay. assist with the presentation. You're welcome. Okay. I'm guessing, yeah. Okay, so while we're waiting to see what we do with that one, let's move on to the next hearing on our list. a question before we do that? Sure. Um, in light of what Jeff just handed out um, in this person's comments, do we know if the parking lot in question in this comment, it, does it meet all current standards, whatever zoning requires? The dentists, I do not know. We just got, I did not have time to investigate. I guess my, I understand the concerns. Right. But some of the issues raised around physical barriers and access, that if some of those are the responsibility of the owner and they're not in place, notwithstanding that somebody's not using, that they're using somebody else's property, I understand that. But if it's because the owner hasn't provided the right controls that we typically ask for, like curbing to show where people can, can and cannot enter and that kind of thing, it would just be useful for us to know that. 
Yes, if they've indicated an address on there of their property, then we can do some research and look look that up. I, mean, I think um, it's separate than this request. Whether it's relevant. It's nice if we just understood that we could inform them perhaps of what their responsibilities sure. are and how it might help them deal with this issue. Yes. And of course they they have a right to to report any illegal parking to Ab the city. Absolutely. But if there are certain things that are required that would help them, oh, and they might not know that, mm -hmm. especially if they didn't develop the site, they just purchased it later or a tenant. So I just, I, I'd like to inform them as much as they can, because they might have more tools available to them if they understood that. Yes. Let's give a street address. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so there is. Great. All right, I'll look into that. Thank you. Okay. okay. Turn. Sure. Uh, the, the next public hearing is SB 2002. This is a special permit for motor vehicle storage and impoundment yard. This is at 361 6th North Street. 63 Arthur Street LLC is the owner and applicant. And this property lies within an industrial class A zoning district. Good evening, board. My name is Jeff Romano. I'm the landscape designer for the project in front of you, 361 6 North Street. My address, 1137 Grand Boulevard, Syracuse. And my name's Todd O'Connor, owner of 65 Arthur Street, LLC. So before you, um, it's a special use permit for the property, uh, 361 6 North Street, for him to use as an impoundment lot. Um, I presume you have the drawing, you have the packet, correct? Yes. So uh, industrial zone, uh, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's an industrial zone. It's, um, he's brought it up to speed. He's got his appropriate fencing. Um, and, and screening for the property to be used as an impound lot. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We're showing his new parking spaces out in front as required. Um, we've included a picture of the front of the building showing, showing the existing signage that's on the building currently, and we're proposing no new signage at all. Uh, pretty cut and dry application. I, so I don't think I need to belabor anything on the on the drawing. So if, if you have any questions for me at this time. Thank you. Are there questions? Just a question for staff. I, I know it's in this document. Um, so for this nature of business, for the impound yard and the location we're talking about, there are no deviations, no waivers, and there's no use restriction. It looks, I mean, that's up front. I just want to put it on the record because the gentleman wouldn't know that. So, Right. Um, it requires a special permit by the Commission and Common Council. However, this body is um, free to impose conditions upon it in order to mitigate any adverse effects that may result um, from the actual land use itself, looking at the surrounding characteristics in the neighborhood. So the city transportation planner pointed out a couple of things in his remarks to us, and I just want to make sure, quickly looking at the site plan, that they're consistent. One of his concern was that you have channelized access points, which would be one 24-inch wide max opening at the right-of-way, and that's what you have, right? I'm sorry. One 24-foot wide maximum opening at the right of way to, to the parcel, right. okay? And you're not asking for a second access point? No. Okay, and basically all turning movements will happen within the property, not on the public sidewalk or in the right of way? Correct, the, the right of way is pretty tight to the edge of the road, so. But everything happens on the private property? Correct. Okay, um, and the last thing was that they had recommended a clear path um, from the front door to the right of way. 
pedestrian path. Pedestrian path. I'm sorry, pedestrian path. And that's maybe the only thing I don't see on here. So you're you show it not to the right of way, but to the parking areas. Correct. I could I could eliminate the one parking space at the head of the at the head of the stairs to delineate a, a route to the road. But it's but it's a reasonable assumption that folks are going to come by vehicle to this place. Correct. He, yes. he operates an impound lot. So right. They get dropped off to pick up a car or they're driving right. off a car. Okay. So I, I think Neil's recommendation is well taken. And if you could do that, fine. But I, I don't think, in my opinion at least, I don't think it's a make or break issue in terms of all the other things that are going on here. But, but generally, you're in conformance with his recommendations that we have before us, it appears. So thank you. Understood. Thank you very much. Other questions? All set. Hey, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. There are individuals who would like to speak in favor of this application. If so, please come forward. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to the application, please come forward. No further speakers. We'll close this hearing and move to our next one. Next public hearing is SP 2003. This is a special permit for a restaurant at 1706 Erie Boulevard East. 1700 Realty Incorporated is the owner, and Isa Torres Lopez is the applicant. Industrial Class A is the zoning district. My name is Alan Kossoff. I'm an architect. I'm representing Mr. and Mrs. Esau Torres Lopez, who wish to create a restaurant in a building on Erie Boulevard East. And I believe that you have the packets with all of the information, including the existing zoning of the property there. Now, in order to do an introduction, I think I seeing how things are going, I'd like to read a, uh, an introduction to you, and I'm going to add some asides to the introduction. You have this there, but I'll read it anyway. Uh, proposed food service establishment at 1706 Erie Boulevard East. Oh, thanks. I said, <clears throat> see architectural drawing survey and site plan attached to this document. Description, the proposal is to create a deli within an abandoned building formerly used as an Asian grocery store. The functions of the spaces will include a food preparation area called a kitchen, an existing walk-in cooler and freezer, a dining area without fixed seats, a new entrance vestibule, and an interior area for display and sales of Hispanic artisans craft items. The location and character is clearly urban, and it is assumed that approximately 20% of the customers will be walk-in and about 80% vehicular. Building construction, I describe it, most of the building is masonry with metal joists and steel roof, but there are two additions in the back that have wood roof joists, and therefore the building is classified as entirely wood frame. We do not need a sprinkler system because there's less than 100 people in the building. We have uh, documents and figures if you want to uh, question that. It is assumed that customers will take out prepared and displayed salads, sandwiches, desserts, and drinks. Some hot food items will be available. A few customers might sit at tables for a short time. Entertainment is not anticipated. Craft iron items will be displayed on hangers and tables. I give a breakdown of the area. Do you have what I'm talking about? This, oh, I don't need to go into that. The existing zoning is Industrial 1A, which permits restaurants. The definition of restaurants includes fast food service establishments such as a deli. In this regard, as an aside, the zoning uh, requirements uh, have only one definition for a restaurant. That could be a restaurant as big as one of the large multi-acre restaurants that we see on the edge of the city. Or it could be a tiny little place as you and I have been in, in Salina Street and uh, 
in Warren Street and so on, where you might have 16 feet of width and 20 feet of depth. So the word restaurant covers a whole variety of different facilities. Therefore, what Mr. Torres Lopez plans is approximately in the middle of that range from very tiny to large. So you see the picture of the building there. And he was lucky, he found a building to lease which has a parking area which has just the right number of parking spaces for his operation. On the site plan you'll see 17 parking spaces. And in a minute I'm going to pass out revised drawings which will show how the parking area is going to be done and other things related to the site. So now I'm going to continue on page two of my introduction. The following is a request to base the floor area of customer use space to determine the quantity of vehicular parking as per the special permits due to the change in use from grocery store to restaurant. Presently the building was a grocery store. Now we need a special permit because the code requires a special permit if you're going to have a restaurant. That is a special use permit. The customer seating area with mobile tables and chairs is 942 square feet. The seating plan indicates 34 seats. One parking space is required for every two customers. 17 spaces would represent the maximum anticipated quantity of vehicles. Now, uh, when Jeff worked out the quantity of vehicles, whatever uh, criteria he used resulted in 55 vehicles. There's no way in which this kind of an operation with occasional drop-in people who might be driving or might be walking would ever get to 55 cars. Everybody involved in this feels that 17 is adequate and we want to make enough space so that when the cars back in and out and drive in and out so they don't bump into each other and you'll see that on the site plan. The site plan shows 19 parking spaces which is deemed to be adequate by the tenant. Since I wrote this uh, with the de definitions that the uh, zoning uh, ordinance required is now reduced to 17. Now regarding open areas, two areas on the west, which is Columbus Avenue, portion of the site, are now overgrown with weeds and small trees. All vegetation and roots will be removed when weather permits and a new lawn will be installed. Most of the stormwater drains through the northwest corner of the site to two catch basins, and this water course will remain. Actually, upon further look at the thing and, and when I obtain the survey there are four catch basins. No other parts of this urban site provide opportunities for landscaping. This is a request to waive all other requirements which might apply to more suburban types of open space. The trash receptacle on the south of the building will be screened with hinge gates. That's shown on the site plan. No additional screening is required. This is a request to the City Planning Commission to approve the use of 1706 Erie Boulevard East for the food service entity described herein together with the accompanying drawings. I submitted this about a month ago and we've made some minor changes as time went on. Now I want to go and give something to you. Do you have a photograph of what the building looks like now? This we, is what the building looks like in the past the money was on your, in your brochure. If you look at the drawings that you have there, we have plans to improve the looks of this building yes. so there will be no connection from what it's going to be to what it is now. From what it is now, what you can see is a derelict, confusing looking setup with signs all over it. This is going to be a well organized looking design. You'll find this on your drawings. Now I'm going to distribute the upgrading of the site plan. Thank you. We need to be one to touch over there. Two. Thank you. Three. Four. Right. We, 
Okay. Sometimes do. And known to share. Me too. That takes me away from it. Okay. Okay, Mr. Torres Lopez is a carpenter and he has worked on projects with people whom I know and he's very qualified to do the construction work himself, whatever has to be done. And he will need several subcontractors. The name of his construction firm is Yagira but he operates it by himself as a total manager. He will need a subcontractor for electrical, one for plumbing, and one for the exterior EFIS uh, surface. Does everyone know what EFIS is? Because I have a sample here that I can bring to you. Now, since I brought this site plan up, if you look at it, Jeff, you didn't know I was going to bring this or what it was going to be. You suggested I bring any <laughs> revisions here. It shows several things. Marked in red along Columbus Avenue is an existing pervious stone bed, eight feet wide, which must have been installed at the time they did the curbs on Columbus. I believe this answers all of the needs in the ordinance regarding pervious surfaces in this uh, in, in the site. But even, see, the, the ordinance required eight feet of this pervious material, which is crushed stone, within the property. But we don't want to do that and can't do it very well, and I'll tell you why in a minute. I believe that the existing red area, pervious stone bed, is adequate to answer the requirement to have an eight foot wide bed within the property lines. And there is no requirement to make 16 feet wide of pervious stone. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Torres Lopez are hardworking people. Mrs. Lopez works in a restaurant. Esau, as I told you, is a carpenter. Between them, they saved enough money to just about handle this project without getting into anything else that requires further expense. Now, while I know that expense is not the issue as far as the zoning ordinance is concerned, they do not have a backing up of uh, investors and stockholders like the large restaurants do on the outside of the city where even a company can sell four locations to buy enough money to do almost anything. They are in that type of market. This is a mom and pop store that they have in mind and as you can see with the 19, oh there's 19 car spaces there, but that would be adequate. I um, <clears throat> had conversations with city departments I spoke to Neil Burke, who is the transportation director, and I had a meeting with Jeff and Neil about a week ago. We found out then that the state of New York has future plans to make alterations to Erie Boulevard East, but the plans are not definite. We do not know what they are or what the state is going to require. But in talking to Neil, he gave me the idea that we ought to define the driveway entrance on Erie Boulevard East. And if you look at your plan, you will see this red plan, this plan I just handed out with red, <clears throat> that 46 feet from the curb line is the, the west side of a 20 foot wide driveway. So I propose to create this driveway now rather than wait for the state to come and tell us what to do. Because if that is in place, then there's less chance of their harming the access in and out of this parking lot. It seems to me that it's very easy and helpful for parking and driving in and out if there are two ways to go in there so that we don't have a dead end with cars backing up and crunching into each other. So that's why I showed this 20 foot wide driveway there. And it is defined with post and chain barriers. I discussed that with 
Neil Burke, and he said this is sometimes used and it's okay with him. They have no objection to it. So instead of a curb, which requires a lot of excavation and construction, I'm showing the post and, be and a chain on the right-hand upper side of the drawing, if you're with me on that. And I showed it coming all the way down Columbus to separate the parking from driving over onto the crushed stone. And then across Erie Boulevard, which Jeff didn't know about because it was only at the meeting last week that I found out that this would be a desirable thing to do. <clears throat> so it shows post and chain on Erie Boulevard. That defines the property. And I picture that these posts will be painted the same color as the building. You have the color charts there with three colors. Does anybody know what I'm talking about with the three colors? Yeah. Okay, so I don't need to show you that. Now, uh, in engineering, there's a Mr. Mirza Melkoch who I spoke to. He is the person who can decide if save the rain is necessary. I sent him the plans, we talked about it. He said that if we disturb the asphalt in that existing parking lot and cut in a curb or do any excavation that they will demand save the rain work. Now the save the rain work would be down at the corner of Columbus and Erie Boulevard because the water drains in that direction. I do not want to stick Mr. and Mrs. Lopez with a cost of putting in underground piping and catch basins and all that kind of construction if we don't have to do it. So I do not wish to cut and, and uh, suggest a curb. That's why we have the post there. So because that cost would be very significant. Um, so basically my whole approach is this, that the, rest, the definition of a restaurant would apply to something much larger and more complicated than we have here. Here's a simple little place that's all set with a parking lot and a building that requires rehabilitation and aesthetic improvements. So that's, I rest my case. Thank you. Are there questions for the applicant? If I could, I'll come over to staff and think about the questions. Is this the first time the staff is seeing the revised plans we have tonight? Yes. So the, because we've got plans that look like they're addressing the curbing issue. Um, do we have time to see if it's addressing everything that was a concern? Because I know it's one of the waivers in our pack. <clears throat> I could make the time. We could look at it while you're doing other things <laughs> right now. <laughs> I'm sorry to my fellow commission members in the chair that the deliberate <laughs> member is now going to look down the aisle and give them time to. But can I, since you're looking at things, um, the Mr. Kossoff mentioned a couple of times the eight foot wide impervious surface something something. For our purposes, it's an eight foot wide landscaping strip. On private property. On private property. And this so is in the right of way. Oh, so this eight foot is. I see. It's a buffer in depth. Gotcha. Inward from the property line. So. So this is drawn from the inside edge of the sidewalk, not from the property line. Based on the drawing, the property line is on the other side of the red, yes. highlighted area. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> So you would need a way to that. Still, right. Among several other several things. Others. Mm -hmm. So this is 20 feet. Well, while staff is kind of eyeballing the revised plan, are there additional questions immediately now for the applicant? Mr. Kosoff, could you 
return to the podium. I think we have a question or two for you. And oh, great. Thank you. I feel pretty sure you know what that kind of a treatment is on the exterior of the building. And as you can see, we <clears throat> In the uh, documents that were given to you before, we show three colors. And you can look on, I think it's drawing two that shows it. Okay, thank you for that example. And. Okay. The question maybe doesn't pertain to this not to material. The, not to the surface, uh, but thank you for showing us that. Um, so. At one point with the parking, you said staff had shown you instead of in our packet, it talked about 19 existing spaces and then leaving a waiver. Um, are you saying that now you have 17 existing spaces? There were 17 at one point, but now I see that we have 19 that are shown, so I'd rather stick with the 19. That's the latest plan in case there's a conflict. So the number we believe good faith is 19 for existing spaces. Um, you still need the curbing waiver. That's correct. Okay. I'm asking for a waiver on all of the other site requirements, okay. largely because I do not want to dig up the area, which means They'd have to have saws to cut the asphalt, dig it up with a backhoe, put it on a truck, take it away, and ruin the parking lot. In, in your presentation, when we talked about most it's mostly, mostly physical issues, mostly the uh, plan, the renovation of the structure, but mostly the parking lot and the exterior, you're, you're talking about having access Just, just for the record, the side and the street that the access is going to be granted from. Could you just put that on the record? Would you kindly clarify your question? So you're saying that you're going to have access in two different ways. I'll, I'll clarify that in a sentence. <clears throat> there is an existing drop curb on Columbus. It can be in and out. It's quite wide. We can have the same thing on Erie Boulevard in that 20-foot driveway, in and out, which gives a lot of flexibility. Okay, so the Columbus sign and Erie Boulevard side. Yes. Two separate places where people could go in and out. Yes. You said there wouldn't be more than 17, or need for more than 17 spaces, but just let's talk about the proposed staff. The which? How, this, how many people will be working there? How many employees? You know, I don't know the answer to that. There are many things about the restaurant I do not know the answer, but I can ask Mr. Torres Lopez, who's here in the audience, how many people will be working here? Uh, we think that it's going to be a small restaurant, so we're going to have about 15 employees, Could Mr. Torres just come up and identify himself? Please. Yeah, for, for, for the record, we, we need your name and address as a speaker. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Isao Torres Lopez. Uh, I live in, in Syracuse. Uh, so, just he asked me how many employees. So, we're thinking uh, like three in the kitchens, uh, two on the countertop because it's going to be a uh, fast food. Uh, Sound like I don't know if you guys see some uh, Hispanic uh, or uh, Caribbean food, and uh, so we don't we don't we don't think we have uh, too many employees. It's gonna be a small small business. So it's fair to say five or six at a time. At the time, yes, okay. yeah. So we are gonna start open nine o'clock for eight hours. I mean two. I say to turn to uh, nah. so some somebody can all I mean all the time six or five. It depends how the business gonna be. Any question? 
and another one. You're thinking breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, it's close to uh, nine, up until nine. Up until nine. Yes. Yeah. yeah, nine to nine to twelve hours. Yeah. Open. Yeah. Thank you. You are. Um, I have a question about uh, on the drawing on along Columbus Avenue, where the you've indicated the eight foot wide <coughs> landscape area within the right of way. I, it's hard to read here, but is there then a, from the edge of that to the beginning of the parking stall? Is that say four feet? There's four feet there. Yes. And are you in, are you proposing that you would install this? post and chain on the property line? The posts with the chains, yes, they would definitely be within the property, within that four foot width. And you're, pro you're proposing to restripe the parking lot? Yes. So it could be possible to take the entire design shift it two feet closer to the building so the space at the building would be Instead of three, five feet, it would be three feet, and you take that two that you gained and add it to the four, and you would have a six foot wide landscape area on the property, which, although not eight feet wide, which is what the ordinance requires, would still allow for that treatment that we're trying to see. And if you're going to restripe anyway, it would literally be just shifting it all two feet to the east. And you could still do, you'd still need a waiver, but if we granted the waiver for the post and chain, it still would be at the head of the parking spaces that front onto Columbus. So you could, you would better approach what the zoning ordinance requires if you could just shift it all that two feet. All of that is possible, but I wish to clarify that my client is not ready, willing, and able to get into digging up the curbs in the parking lot in order to achieve a few more feet of. I'm not, I'm not suggesting a curb. I'm trying to get to the landscape area that we need, which, which would be permeable, which presumably would not end up creating the issue that you noted before. I want to bring this up again and clarify that Neil Burke told me that if we dig it up and make any ch uh, trenches or adjustments or milling of the parking lot, that Save the Rain will kick in. And that means digging up more and putting in catch basins and many other things. The folks that's here is not paved. Um, I don't know. Let me see. I'm looking at this image. No, it's all paved. There are loads of utilities along Erie Boulevard, so it's not going to be so easy to dig it up. Okay. Pardon thank, me? thank you for your responses to those additional questions. I'd like to ask you something. <clears throat> when will you come up with a decision as to whether you will grant these waivers? It's not clear. <clears throat> um, it's possible it could be tonight, or it's possible that it could be at a subsequent meeting. So what we typically do is after the hearings have all concluded, and the hearings have been closed, we try to return uh, to each of those applications and act upon them. If there's a motion one way or the other, gain, garnering enough support from the commission members. Failing that, or in the, in the instance where additional information or clarification might be needed, we would hold off <coughs> and get the additional clarification required and render a decision at a subsequent meeting. Subsequent meeting would be three weeks from now, or our next or scheduled meeting is three weeks. February. Yeah, the th third of February.
I don't think that I have anything else to add to it. I'm just asking to sure. approve my request for the waivers, including the landscape area along Columbus Ave. So I'll pick up my papers and go. Thank you. Thank you both. While you're doing that, I will ask if there are members of the public who might wish to speak in favor of this application. If so, please come forward, <coughs> provide your name and address in your comments. And I will also extend the same invitation to those who wish to speak in opposition to the application. If anyone is of that mindset, please come forward, provide your name and address, and your comments. So we have no additional speakers. I think we're in a position to close this hearing and move to our next application. Our next public hearing is R1985. This is a resubdivision to combine two properties into one new lot at 318 and 22 Webster Avenue. Nathaniel and Renita Scott and the Greater Syracuse Property Development Corporation are the owners and applicants. Both properties are within a residential class AA zoning district. Good evening. My name is Taisha Martin. I'm here with Nita, uh, 101 Gertrude Street, Syracuse, New York. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the resub for the resubdivision of 318 and 322 Webster Avenue. Uh, 322 Webster Avenue was acquired by the Land Bank in May of 2018. The dilapidated single family house that was demolished by the Land Bank left a 38 by 132 square foot vacant lot. Well, it looks like there's a um, like they have a lot, uh, a lot of uh, space behind the house. It's mostly thickly wooded and unusable. Um, so rather than leave the property vacant, the land bank would like to sell the lot to the owners of 318 Webster Avenue, and that's Mr. and Mrs. Nathaniel and Renata Scott. Um, I think you have a site map there that shows um, a shared driveway between both properties that the applicant would like to um, adjust to be uh, tw by 12 foot. It looks like they have to remove a portion and then create another 12 foot. Uh, and uh, the land bank believes that this would be in the best interest of the neighborhood and the community. Questions for the applicant? Thank you. Are there individuals who would like to speak in favor of this application? If so, please come forward. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to the application, please come forward. Other speakers will declare this hearing closed and move to our next application. Next public hearing is R2001. This is also a resubdivision, and this is to combine two properties into one new lot at 117 and 119 McAllister Avenue. Michael and Josephine Atkins and the Greater Syracuse Property Development Corporation are the owners and applicants. And these also lie within a residential class AA zoning district. <laughs> Hello again, uh, Taisha Martin with NIDA, 101 Gertrude, Syracuse, New York. Uh, here on behalf of 117 and 119 McAllister Avenue. Um, 117 McAllister Avenue was acquired by the Land Bank in September of 2015. The Land Bank demolished two, uh, a two family house and garage. They also removed a driveway, leaving a 38 by 132 square foot vacant lot. Um, rather than leave the property vacant, the land bank would like to sell the lots uh, to the owners of 119 McAllister Avenue, and that's Mr. and Mrs. Michael and Josephine Adkins. Uh, do you have any questions on this one? Questions? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Are there individuals who would like to speak in favor of this application? If so, please come forward. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to the application, please come forward. No additional speakers. This hearing is closed, and we'll move to our next application. The next public hearing is R2002. This is also a resubdivision to combine three properties into one new lot at 201, 203, and 205 Davis Street, Lewis and Maria Ramos. 
and the Greater Syracuse Property Development Corporation are the owners and applicants, and these also lie within a residential Class AA zoning district. For a record tonight, huh? <laughs> I love it. Um, so, Taisha Martin Nita, uh, 101 Gertrude, Syracuse, New York. Uh, here on behalf of 201, 203, and 205 Davis Street Resubdivision. Division. Uh, 203 Davis and 205 Davis were acquired by the Land Bank in the summer and fall of 2015, respectfully. respectfully. Uh, both properties had blighted two family homes that were demolished by the Land Bank, leaving two 33 by 100 square foot vacant lots. Um, rather than leave the vacant lot, the, the lots vacant, the Land Bank would like to sell the lot to the owner of 201 Davis Street, um, and that's Luis and Maria Ramos. Um, the resubdivision will provide more defensible space, increase the homeowner's property value. Um, it's also the case that the land has <coughs> adjacent um, uh, property in the area at, um, I'm sorry, I disregard that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Questions for the applicant? Yeah. I do. Um, Ms. Martin, <clears throat> excuse me, we have one question here for you, or maybe more than one. Is this going to be owner-occupied? Uh, yes. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this application? If so, please come to the podium. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to the application, please come forward. Everyone who wishes to speak has spoken on this. We'll declare the hearing closed and move to our next hearing. <coughs> the next public hearing is 3S2001. This is a three mile limit subdivision review in the town of DeWitt. This is the Glenlock subdivision to divide one property into two new lots at 4626 North Street. Rolling River Re LLC is the owner and applicant. If the applicant is here, please come forward. Or the representative. Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this application? If so, please come to the podium. Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to the application, please come forward. Uh, so before we close the hearing, I just want to confirm the application is complete. Okay, not unusual on the three mile limit cases to have no speakers, so we'll declare that this hearing closed and moved to our next. Next public hearing is 3S2002, also a three mile limit subdivision review. This is in the town of Lafayette. Mark Shute Farm subdivision is to realign two properties into two new lots at 3887 Eager Road. And Mark Shute is the owner and applicant. The applicant is here, please come to the podium. And if there's anyone who would like to speak in favor of this application, please come forward. And if there's anyone who would like to speak in opposition to the application, please come forward. So no speakers in this case. Again, I presume the application is complete as it stands in the file now. Yes. We'll declare this hearing closed. Our uh, last three mile limit case this evening. Last public hearing is 3S2003, also a three mile limit subdivision review. This is in the town of DeWitt. The Wheelock subdivision to divide two properties into one new lot is proposed at 98 Lynbrook Circle and Jamesville Road. Diane Wheelock Living Trust and JLW Holding 10 LLC are the owners and applicants. Yeah, I bet I know what's going to happen. If the applicant is here, please come forward, provide your name and address and a summary. Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this application? Please come to the podium. And if there's anyone who would like to speak in opposition to the application, please come forward. No speakers. Once again, on a three-mile three limit case, uh, the application can staff confirm is complete as we as it stands now. Just confirming that the application for the yes. second DeWitt three-mile limit case is complete. Yes, sir. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. And that being the case, we'll close this hearing. Uh, let us return to the status of our earlier hearing to see if we might have uh, an additional presenter to talk about the application. Did we, do we know the outcome of that effort? Are you, are you ready to? Me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, can, I, can I use a uh, speak? Good evening. So my speakerphone, phone, uh, my friend to talk to you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, we just uh, rent this space, so uh, owner of the property, so he don't have time to come in here. So that's why. So. Do you mind holding it up to the mic so that? Sure. sure okay. Sure. Sorry so that it, that. okay. Okay. Because this is being recorded. I can just speak a phone from uh, what a queer, huh? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, the goal? Okay, sir. I'm going to This is going to be interesting. Um, Chad, you While he's getting set up, I'm just going to suggest to you folks that a number of the items that require waivers are basically in effect because the larger development okay. be approved, oh. like setback, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, actually, if not all of them, except for maybe the signage. And perhaps in light of the language problem, we can focus on those items that, in effect, we did not create. <laughs> I think that's very appropriate, especially where you feel you have enough information about a specific waiver already uh, yes. to just focus on those that you have questions about. And I guess I, I would be willing to even be more specific for my colleagues that the issue of the eight foot wide landscape treatment is something we basically dealt with when we approved the first, when we approved the initial project. Correct? Um, I believe. I mean, the, the issue of whether or not there was any landscaping. I mean, a lot of these things we addressed as part of that larger project. Yes. Well, just to clarify, mm -hmm. those requirements were not a requirement. Oh, my God. Because it under wasn't a product restaurant. site review. It's only because it's a restaurant that those regulations are applying. Did they just apply for a commercial space? So there was no previous waiver granted for any I buffering see. because it wasn't required. Well, it was a good idea. Um, I liked it. I know, I was really feeling good about that. Yes, please. Let's see what you can do with that. Again, I think what, what we're all thinking about is the condition is created by a development we approved. In other situation, if we had an existing building and we would say the person moving in now to be the new tenant has to live with the existing condition, we sometimes put our rationale for the waiver on the fact that, yes. you know, again, if they were in Tip Hill or if they were exactly. moving into some other structure that would be a lovely structure but built in another time Ooh. and curbs were built in another time. Um, I think that may be our thought process. So we're coming up with a rationale because this is somebody becoming a tenant in a structure that's affected by everything else around it. And so perhaps if we focused on parking and signage. Exactly. And we will. And we will. <laughs> <laughs> the other are essentially pre existing conditions, uh, site conditions. And I endorse the effort to focus on the items that uh, are more under the domain of the applicant and his, and his partners, that being the parking and the signage. So is your okay. colleague on the phone now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my friend say he can, can hear about anything you're talking. <laughs> so that's why I just read, uh, okay. Ar Arctic uh, number 17, our yes. 
our business market to get on uh, students from University of Syracuse hospital employees and uh, tenant lay life in the building most working customer we are now looking to bring customer from suburban areas okay and uh, article 18 Having sign in front of the, our business is really important for our brand image. We are aiming to create popularity. I'm sorry, popularity in the area and among college students. One of the use for the sign is for our customers to take a photo and uh, share on any uh, secure media platform. And the wall sign can be anywhere 40 60 inches. And about the up <coughs> 19 and 20, the side wall of the city uh, is existing and has been approved approved by the planning board division before the city were built. And uh, we just lease in a place. We don't own a building, so can I let you see this one? I, I'm, we're, I think we're okay. I think we got the. Oh, okay. You clear what I say? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Sense of what you were saying, and I'm glad that technology was able to come to the rescue here uh, and help out. So while we have your colleagues still on the line, are there any additional questions we want to? Um, I, I just want to ask a question about the sign. So if I look at this drawing, how did you decide it was two signs? This is for them. You're okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one the application indicates that. Well, oh, okay. Also, there is a wall sign. Um, Tai Chi those words, uh, so page 49, that's the one. Oh. It would yeah, be, um, it says page 23. It's not showing pages. But, right, well, um, I don't, I don't even have a number you guys, so. <laughs> if you go past the elevation plans, there are sign details. Sign details. Mm -hmm. Maybe. The round circles? Yes. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> so it's not the drawing, is what you're telling me. It's not whatever. Um, of course, there's no sheet sign on this. There's no, the drawing's not labeled by number. Perfect. Um, it's not this. It's all horizontal. It's the round symbols, which are yeah. I, there is one that's horizontal with the name and what they sell. Then there's another one that is round on the elevation. So there's this, right? Yes, that's one sign. That's one sign, and then this is like the second. They're this. not doing that one. They're, They're doing, doing that. that. They want to do Okay. That's the second And this sign. one, is it 40 square feet? And this one obviously isn't. Correct. Gotcha. But there's no reason it couldn't be because you just could Correct. scale it down. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then it would just be a number. A, a, number. The number. Okay. I'm good. Any other questions? 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank your colleague as well for joining us by phone to uh, address these questions. We appreciate it. Thank you, sir. So now. I did, I did just want to recommend that if the board is uh, leaning more towards approving or uh, putting reasonable conditions on waivers, it's very appropriate to act tonight. But if uh, if you feel you have enough information, but I would recommend that if you are thinking of denying any of the waivers to hold open, just given uh, in the interest of equity, given that the applicant has expressed that he has a language barrier, that it would be in his best interest and everybody's best interest to get further information. He's done an excellent job today in getting help from his friend, and we Very applaud him for that. Very resourceful, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the first time we've had speakerphone on the record. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about it. No, that's just, awesome. Um, just for clarification, even if it's a, a modest I think condition? It, if it's a modest condition, I think that's reasonable, considering um, that you're – essentially making that condition based on, on the plans that have been submitted, which appear to me to be pretty thorough. Um, but that's if it's a conditional approval, I think that would be appropriate. Um, but if it's a denial. Okay, so yeah. if it's a conditional approval, good. If it was an outright denial, you'd have a concern. Yes, gotcha. yes. Okay, thank you. Good advice. We appreciate that guidance. And before we even get to that part of our thinking, uh, let me ask if there is anyone in the audience who would like to speak in favor of this application. And if so, please come forward providing your name and address and your comments. And then is there anyone who might wish to speak in opposition to the application? If so, please come forward to offer your comments. Uh, so we don't apparently have any uh, opposition or support from the general public which now gets us to the point that Madam Legal Counsel is just providing in terms of uh, moving forward on this application. And before we uh, close or consider closing this hearing, I guess we might have a little bit of discussion. Okay, all right, then we'll close this uh, hearing. <clears throat> And uh, thank you very much. I think yes, we have what we need. And again, thank you. Uh, thank your colleague as well for participating uh, by phone. Thank you, sir. So we have now, I think, completed all the hearings that were on our schedule for this evening. So as is our custom, we'll return to those just closed. So, we closed all of the hearings that we entertained this evening, and so we'll start at the top of the list. Oh, thank you. We'll start at the top of the list, and where there is uh, uh, support for action one way or the other, we will take action on these applications this evening. Otherwise, uh, we might have to defer. So, starting with our very first hearing this evening, AS-19-14A. Uh, the sign waiver appeal on South State Street. This was a continuation from our previous meeting in 2019. Uh, we had additional information uh, this evening as well. The hearing's been closed. Is there a motion one way or the other on the uh, waiver appeal? I would move to um deny the application in support of the zoning administrator's um, reissuance of the previously expanded waiver, or of the waiver, because there's been no change in the character of the neighborhood, the building, or any of the surroundings. And if anything, the uh, tenant is actually op going to occupy less square footage than that which was uh, granted the previous waiver. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. I'm sorry, just a quick question. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I also would 
I'd like you to uh, provide justif a further justification if because there's been no change in the character okay. of the neighborhood, the building itself, the surroundings that would justify granting an additional expansion okay. of the previous waiver. And as I noted, the entity for which this is being requested is taking up even less square footage. I may have missed some of what you said because my pen ran out of ink. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't. I, I think you had mentioned that. Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. And Jeff takes copious notes if he's got it. <laughs> But Walter wanted to say something. Okay. So, Jack, we have grass now for why. Um, if we take this action, then it's, it's simply restoring the action taken by the administrator. Right. Okay. So it's still a waiver from what's allowed. Okay. It's just what we pre what this body, a previous constitution of this body, approved years ago, or that she granted years ago. Okay. It's still more than what's basically allowed in the ordinance. Okay. I follow. Yep. Okay. Thank you for explaining. <laughs> Further discussion or additional questions uh, or points of clarification? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? So the appeal fails. And we move to the special permit on East Genesee Street, SP-20-21, the project that we just um, concluded with the help of the telephone uh, and the applicant's colleague. Is there a motion on this? I would move approval with a negative declaration granting all of the waivers except for the sign waiver that the allowing the two wall signs but that they both be within 40 square feet second discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. those opposed say nay any abstentions uh, the special permit is approved with the condition noted. And perhaps, uh, sir, your application was approved. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so next. Maybe you could mark that on the yeah. page for him. Right. Approved, but with a condition. So next, we are at the uh, special permit for the impoundment yard, SP-20-12 on 6th North Street. Is there a motion on this? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 <coughs> Suppose, say nay. Any abstentions? That special permit is approved. We're now looking at the special permit on Erie Boulevard East, SP-20-03. Uh, for the restaurant. I know we closed this. Um, I, can, could, could we consider reopening it and clarifying with whomever that if there were a way to get the landscaped area on the property by shifting everything and basically saw cutting one line of pavement, whether or not the Save the Rain stuff comes in. I, I mean, we're creating a landscaped area. One would hope yeah, that it would ameliorate any concerns. But I think there's some misunderstanding here because by removing the impervious service, surface, 
seems like that should not trigger a need for save the rain work right. but the applicant said otherwise and I wonder if he perhaps misunderstood the transportation planners comments or perspective on this um, and if so I think there's some confusion there and if not on the part of the applicant it's certainly on my part because I'm not following so is the best course of action to reopen this hearing get that clarification from the DPW or can we simply leave the hearing closed and request that clarification from the transportation planner so I'll let Catherine answer that question however I I don't know what verbal conversations Mr. Kossoff had with anyone. I can just go by what is um, mm -hmm. commented in on written, in, in writing the from the different departments. What it seemed to me, having, having been doing this for a while, is that there is a requirement for a, a SWIP if you're disturbing more than 10,000 square feet of area, stormwater pollution prevention plan. I don't know if I will confirm, as you're saying, but to trigger a Save the Rain, I believe that's a grant that you apply for that's, it's not triggered by anything. So um, I, perhaps there was some mis, uh, misunderstanding, some, yeah. um, but certainly I will get that information and I will let Catherine answer the other question in the meantime. Okay. A two-parter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, simp you can keep the hearing closed and request information as you feel you need it. Um, reopening the hearing would, of course, trigger um, notice again and give people an opportunity to come again, which could be a good thing, um, especially if there was confus confusion. And I am inclined to recommend that in that it sounds like we may have to reach out to more than one person in that if especially if the applicant's representative was confused about something um, we would have to sort of figure out what that confusion was and reach out to the transportation and I wasn't sure who the person engineering. engineering engineering for those comments um, so given that can you have to reach out to a few sources including the applicant I think it's advisable to reopen the hearing okay thank you um, so moved <laughs> discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. suppose say nay any abstention so we will reopen this hearing um, request the clarification that we need to make a more informed decision on this application and um, with a little luck we'll have that information available by the end of our next meeting and be in a better position to take action on this so Thank you all for participating in that discussion. So this hearing is reopened or held open. Uh, we now move to the first of several resubdivisions. This one on Webster Ave, R-19-85. Is there a motion on this application? I move approval of the declaration. Second. Discussion? I'd just like to note that it's an oddly shaped lot, but most of the well-established patterns in the neighborhood have already been greatly altered so I think that it makes sense to, to approve it so noted uh, discussion further comment all in favor please say aye aye, aye. those opposed say nay any abstentions uh, that resubdivision is approved we move next to the one on McAllister Ave R-20-01 Presented uh, earlier this evening. No other speakers. Is there a motion on this? Move approval of the negative declaration. Second. Discussion? I would just make the same comment that perhaps not to the same degree as the previous application, but there's already been some alteration of the established neighborhood patterns. Thank you for that uh, justification. Uh, additional comments or discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? That resubdivision is approved. Our last resubdivision of the evening on Davis Street, R-20-02. Uh, same situation as the previous one, presented by the 
uh, representative and no additional speakers. Is there a motion on this? I move approval with a negative declaration. Second. And same comment. Probably more so than the other two applications, there is virtually no identifiable pattern in the neighborhood. Favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? That reset division is approved. Uh, next, the first of three three mile limit cases. This one in the town of DeWitt, 3 S 20 01. Is there a motion on this? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? That reset division is approved. Next is the one in the town of Lafayette, 3S-20-02. Is there a motion on this? Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? That re three mile limit case is approved. And back to the town of DeWitt for the second three mile limit case, 3S 20 03. Is there a motion on this? We have approval with a negative declaration. Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? That three mile limit case is also approved. Uh, that takes us through all the hearings held this evening, but we now move to new business. And we have a couple of items here. Okay. Uh, Heather, can you Sure. So please? this new business item um, is um, a project site review for facade alterations at 300 South State Street. And this is to um, put a lighting band around the top of the building to um, highlight the uh, it's LED accent light strip. and. The reason I brought it to your attention is because of the sign waiver. Um, something that's appropriate, I can send planning commission. I'm sorry, I can send project site reviews to the planning commission. Um, so we didn't want to uh, have things disjointedly uh, reviewed. Um, so it is for your consideration, and um, it is accent lighting in the form of a project site review through our office. So. Also of clarification that uh, Brody Smith, the counsel for the applicant in the hearing that we heard today, just informed me that his client, um, he is not representing this case, so he's not appearing on this case. This appears to have been submitted by the landlord for the building, so um, they were not aware of it still today. So while it's the same property and it's appropriate to view together in, in light of the the fact the environmental impacts of a project for something that's happening out in the same building, they are not uh, related um, as directly related by the, the applicants sub were submitted separately mm -hmm. okay good to know <laughs> one shouldn't assume why he didn't want to die together short answer when I asked do you want to present both things yeah. together and he said no so. yeah. <laughs> well if he just found out about it I can understand so is there anyone here well, it's just a new business item. Oh, oh, to speak. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I, well, yeah. either to represent whoever the applicant is, uh, Brew Place Park Place LLC, okay. uh, or well, Greg Fischel. I think he was here earlier this evening. Anyways, yeah. Um, so typically, I rep I present these on behalf of the okay. owner, much like. Um, minor modifications for special permits okay. so okay. so in that regard then anything particularly noteworthy or of concern with the proposed lighting for that particular building or the manner in which it would be uh, implemented well all of the uh, the information is here if you want to not decide on it and and let me um, that's certainly your purview I just brought it before you because mm -hmm. sometimes when there is a certain action on a property and then another one that might not come before you uh, Avoid potential segmentation. 
avoid potential segmentation under seeker, yes. So. Right, right. <laughs> no, we appreciate so. that. Uh, so let's see if there are, first of all, any questions on what is being actually proposed here. As I understand it, it's not lighting that projects outward or even upward. It's just immediately around the top of the building, correct, with a color accent that changes nightly or potentially nightly? It entails more than one color per night. Um, no, does not, does not, right. sorry. One color um, per night. Yes, if you look at the one, two, three, fourth bullet down, um, it's direct view LED accent strip, and it does not change colors. Um, it doesn't light the entire facade like flood lighting or consist of any changing, flashing, or rotating light. <coughs> It does illuminate, the photo simulation illustrates that it illuminates the surrounding sky above the building. So, What do we think is, the, it's gonna go around the whole, all four sides? Yes, all four sides. And so the, it will be even with some of the apartments across Fayette Street. I was thinking when I saw it. I don't think there's apartments across Fayette Street. It's under construction right now. You can see. Oh, I, across, across Fayette Street there, yes. I see. Decide on this one. I, we can certainly do that. Uh, it sounds like uh, I don't know if we need a motion for this or if this can be by consensus, but everyone seems to be nodding uh, yes to the idea of um, uh, delegating this to the zone, uh, sign administrator, zoning administrator to um, right. for disposition. Thanks. You accept? <laughs> You're remanding it back to me. Yeah. yeah. Um, a motion just for the record yeah. sure is there a motion to that effect so moved and i'll take yours as a second discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. those opposed say nay any abstentions and thank you for calling it to our attention so yep. we could have a little bit of discussion about it, especially in light of the other action earlier tonight on the same property okay. so with that we move we have another item of new business Yes, this is, we put this under the category of modification consideration um, because it does require an expanded waiver of one parking space based on the changes. Um, this was a project site review to modify, and this is to modify the floor plan and the elevations. And when I say floor plan, I mean the parking area underneath that, that plan. Um, at 401, 403, 405, 407, 409, and 411 to 413 Prospect Avenue, BWI, BWI Hotel Acquisition 1, LLC is the owner, and Richard Pietrafeza is the applicant. It lies within a business class A zoning district. This was very recently approved by the commission um, as well as a resubdivision. Um, there is a representative here from the architectural office if you would like any further explanation, but um, there are elevation changes uh, with respect to um, color and material, and also taking away one parking space by rearranging um, the garage area. So um, very happy to turn it over to the architect after he's come all this way and you and waited here all, for all this, this time, time. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should have an opportunity to um, present what the change is I know it's not significant in terms of one space but there are materials involved as well so maybe you could just um, give us an overview so John Bartolotti with Delpaz Architects um, representing the owner um, Delpaz is 101 North Clinton Street Syracuse New York so as Heather mentioned, yep, there's, as we submitted for building permit and uh, the design kind of matured, um, things kind of got developed a little further. And <clears throat> with the addition of 
um, some of the mechanical rooms, some of the accessibility issues, some of the requirements that we got, you know, shaken out. Uh, it looks like we squeezed out one space that we fell short of just because of all the, the actual sizes as they come into play. So, um, and that happened on the upper parking level. So I think we had 48, now we have 47. The first floor we have um, 40 or 68 still remains. And then on the fenestration, um, <clears throat> although they're minor, I mean, there's still revisions. Um, some of the things that change, there really isn't a color change, or not an intended color change at least. Um, we changed out a material. So there was, and we've highlighted them here on this rendering so that it's easier to see the red, which was D before, which was this color. We're saying we're not going to use that material, and we're replacing it with the material we had here, but it's matching in the same color. These, these colors were supposed to match to begin with. So it, it really, from, a, from a, a distance, you really can't tell what it is. This was a cementitious board, and now it's an EIFS. So here, so that's really the difference. So the color change scheme hasn't done. The other change that fenestration wise is as we've developed the parking and the requirements for <coughs> fire ratings, adjacent properties, uh, we're limited to our opening sizes. So I think we had, we increased these openings over here to the size that we could get to get maximum um, flow for ventilation because we want to also try to ventilate the space and that was the issues we did. Now that we got a little further along, we know exactly what we can do and maximize these and these here and even them out so that we got better circuit flow through the, um, the, par the parking. And then on the upper level, between these bump outs, here to here, here to here, you'll see this little shadow line here. That wall has come out about uh, three feet. And that is the sixth floor. And in the floors below are our hotels. And in the big corners, it works really well. But when we got up to the, the uppermost floor, it was very tight in the apartment. So we just expanded that out. And, and the last change, really, that, that we did with that was we increased these windows just to make them kind of work with the, with the thing. So essentially, it's, as you can look at, here's the old, old one behind it. And, and we took these windows out, the horizontal windows here. So that's what we had before. The colors were here. This was just an extension of this before. And when you flip it down to this side, so this sticks out a little bit, these colors, and this is just a solid panel right now. So, although they're, they are revisions, hooked up here, um, we consider them minor from the overall intent and the exterior, but they were picked up as we're coming through in the permitting process, so we wanted to make sure that we We appreciate the um, um, presentation of the changes, even though they do, uh, granted, appear to be quite uh, modest in nature and scope, but um, it's good to have the presentation and have um, this body align with, or what's built align with what this body is approved. So uh, let's pause, see if there are any questions on what you just uh, walked us through, and proceed from there. I have one question for clarification. Yes. The previous project site review approval in clearly included four different materials of four different colors as illustrated on the elevation plans at that time. These Correct. Right here. The proposed elevations for tonight as submitted by with the application only indicate three uh, finishing materials and colors. So for the record, could you please specify which four finishing materials and which three colors are being uh, proposed? Yep, you're, you're absolutely right. We had four materials. Um, material A, which is a hardy plank color, Sherwin-Williams, uh, proposed SW7047, that still remains. Uh, B was EIFS color, Sherwin-Williams, Felted wool, SW9171, that still remains. C, EIFS color, Sherman Williams, useful gray, SW7050, still remains. And we omitted D, which is James Hardy uh, reveal panel, system 48, four foot by eight foot color, which was a Grecian ivory. We replaced the Grecian ivory color, slash, that's the manufacturer's color name, with the EIFS useful gray, see? And <clears throat> those two materials originally 
were intended to be very similar in color. So. I'm sorry, I'm still not clear. I understand you took away the Hardy Plank, Grecian, that item. This and was here. You're saying you took away that material and you're using one of the other three materials but with the, with the same color. Oh. The, the, the color of the C has a name of useful gray. The color of D, which we omitted, has a, has a name of Grecian ivory. Yes. When you put those two together, they're very similar colors, all I'm saying. But we are, we are omitting the, the Grecian ivory. So you're just using more of product C. Correct. In the same color. More of C. Yeah. In, a a, in a different place. place. So there's three products. So there are products. just three finishing materials and three colors. Right. That's correct. <laughs> that is correct. Yes. <laughs> color by name, yes. Yes, that's correct. Ivory lost out. Yep. They didn't make didn't make the cut. Okay, that happens. In our house, we didn't see the difference. But just saying. And, and part of the reason was uh, some of the detailing as you're going around the building and insulation values as we got into it. You know, and what we do, the IFS gave us better insulation values there, so it supported it. Was we we thought, in our opinion, that it was a very minor color shade difference that you'd see. So it, we're happy with that. Additional questions? Good? Good, yes, Good. thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. In that instance, is there a motion for action on this proposed modification to the previously approved project site review? Move to approve the, the submitted modifications. Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Uh, finishes new business. We move to old business. We have one, two, three, four items under old business, all with the same applicant. And yes. two folks are probably here for those four. Yep. And I think. So I can. Or not. I can announce them. Um, these were held over. The commission asked for a timeline and a work plan. So I will just go. I guess. Would you like to go through them one by one? Uh, we, we could read them out, and as we do with many hearings, read them out uh, together and then act separately. For the sure. Record. Yeah, that makes sense. More efficient. All right. So. First one is uh, SR1604, and these are all time extensions. This is for site plan review. Um, this was to demolish an existing building and construct a five-story building. 328 West Kirkpatrick Street is the address, and Core West Kirkpatrick Street Company, LLC, is the owner and applicant. This is in Lakefront T51, and they are asking for an extension Hold on. Um, till March 28th of 2024 and the initial deadline was March 28th of 2017 so I know the representatives are here and have waited a long time so I'm sure they can give you so, more information but can we run? Oh, you want me to go through yeah, them all? Yeah. Okay. And then they uh, can sure. kind of. So SR1605, a site plan once. review for a time extension to reconstruct an existing parking lot at 128 Spencer Street. And this is Core Spencer Street Company, LLC, is the owner and the applicant. And this is in the Lakefront T5 zoning district. And this extension is for March until March 16th of 2022 the original deadline was March 16th of 2017 the next time extension request is SR 1611 this is for was for a site plan review to construct a two-story mixed-use building at 425 Solar Street core Solar Street Company 
2 LLC is the owner and the applicant, and this is within the Lakefront T51 zoning district. The original, I'm sorry, the deadline that they're requesting now is August 22nd of 2022. The original deadline was August 22nd of 2017. The last request is SP1610, which is <clears throat> was for a special permit for civic use. And this is at 425 Solar Street, the state of New York. Is the owner? That's right. Okay. Core Solar Street Company 5 LLC is the applicant. And this is uh, within the Lakefront T51 zoning district and also has a civic space uh, promenade as part of the zoning map. And this one is for a deadline of August 22nd of 2022. And the original deadline was August 22nd of 2017. That's it, four of them. Yep. <clears throat> Good evening, um, I'm Kate Johnson. I'm with Core Development. I have Carly Hansen here who is the Director of Architecture at Core Development as well. Um, I feel like this got a little mixed up and um, I apologize uh, for that, but um, you know, we originally requested a one-year extension um, and it came to this board and it was not acted on is my understanding. Um, we also then worked told to ask for, um, because a one-year extension wasn't going to get us anywhere, um, as you know, we, we requested these before they expired. Um, they were all requested six, to, six weeks to two months before they expired. So um, it just got held up in planning. So when we asked for the one-year extension, it now becomes the one-year extension takes you to like March So of this year. So that doesn't really help anybody. Um, or at least doesn't help us. Um, so we were then asked, what is your realistic uh, need for an extension? And we asked for five years for the Element Hotel and three years for the others. Um, we have spent significant money on the plans. We have architecture, engineering, um, landscaping, surveying, geotechnical. You, you don't, weren't all on the board at the time, but um, these were approved. Um, and. What we're dealing with at the Inner Harbor is we're creating a new neighborhood, and, and it's, there's nothing, there was nothing there, um, as you know. I mean, surrounding, yes, but um, and it, who wants to be first in that Inner Harbor? I mean, who wants to be the only tenant? So we've, it's not an easy sell, um, and you need density to, cr to have commercial entities go there. They need people, and um, the people in the residential want commercial entities surrounding them because they want to go and do and go to restaurants and have things to do. So we're, the synergy is, is difficult to create and we're working very hard at that. Did we think it would take this long? We didn't. The flip side of that is um, the way your ordinance works is you know you get an approval for a building that takes two years to complete, takes six months to get a building permit. You already need an extension within before you gotten any, anywhere near building your building, even if you were to go out today and apply for your building permit. So the, the, two, the one year way the ordinance works from your approval, it doesn't work in the size of, and you know this, you've, you've seen it, you've been through it. So we have, you know, for instance, the Iron Pier was approved, it was built, and you just recently, it, it has tenants in it, it's 80% occupied, there's 112 apartment buildings, or units, and um, the first floor has two tenants in commercial. We have a third one coming on that's gonna get a building permit this spring, or actually in the next month or so. Um, and they, we need an extension on that, even though the building's built, um, because we don't have a CFO for the first floor. And so each time we come in, you need to have this, um, this in place, is my understanding. If that's wrong, that would be great, but that's what I was, how I understood it. So. What, and I'm not trying to keep you here all night, I just want to make sure I'm giving you the context for these, these re requests. Um, 
We did develop the Aloft Hotel. It is occupied. We did develop the Iron Pier uh, and a parking lot associated to, you know, so the four permits that we, approvals we received, we got permits for, we developed. Um, we now are excited because Bankers Healthcare is going there, and it's across from the hotel. And, you know, there were buses there, and who wants to be across from smelly buses, you know? Um, so that's great. That's great news. We think that there is a lot of interest in the harbor. We are excited, and we are hoping that the Bankers Health and, and the things that we've been doing, we've been advertising, we've been having events down there, we've been showing people that there's water and that there's space here for the public, and isn't this a great place to develop? Um, so, again, that's the backdrop for this. Um, we do have tenant interest. It helps immensely when you can say to a tenant, the approvals are in place for this building that we're showing you that we'd like you to lease. That means they can say, look, I have to be out of this space by this date, and I know that you can get a building permit, say it takes six months, and you know it's 18 months to build this. I can plan. Whereas if I say I don't have any permits in place, well, good luck, ma'am. Go get your permits, and I'll come back when I'm ready. So it's very important for us, um, for CORE, to keep these permits in place. And when I think about it, too, I think if we're denied an extension, which, you know, um, is your prerogative, one of the options would be to come back and apply for the same. I have the plans. I have, there's, we meet the zoning ordinance as it stands right now and, and go through it again and get an approval and have one year on my, my approval. So I'm trying to make sense of um, what it is that is concerning about granting extension. So I, I'd be happy to try and explain um, where we are with each of these. I, I, I do have... Um, thoughts on that or, or I can explain to you you know our situation if that's helpful to the request I don't know if it is but I don't you know I don't want to keep your your time here um, because it is a Monday night um, but I guess what I'm asking is I want to be reasonable I want to ask for a reasonable extension I want to work with what you what your concerns are and in the framework of what's driving um, you know the way your ordinance is written and, and what you're trying to adhere to. I do want to, I do want to work on that, but I don't, I guess, um, right now, um, it seems to me we were, we are asking for something that we think is realistic. If that's not realistic, um, you know, we can discuss that. I mean, if that's something you're not inclined to grant. Um, I just, I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, is there something that you want to ask that, that maybe I can be maybe assisting? Maybe we do pause here for um, questions. I was going to say, maybe go ahead and give a quick thumbnail sketch on yeah. each of these sites. But, sure. Um, do, you, do you want to start with that and then see if there are questions? I, I think more than anything, it's probably the absence of an understanding or information about what these were about, the timeline. And one has a really long timeline associated with it. Um, and in the absence of an understanding of what was going on or what was likely to go on, um, there was a luck, reluctance to act in that yeah, void sure. without asking to come and provide some more information. And That's I, totally fair. I was just going to say to that point, and maybe just to cut to the chase, none of these, you have not drawn drawn a building permit for Correct. any of them, none of them are under construction. That's right. Okay. I think for me, and I'm not going to speak for my colleagues, that's a big difference from all the other time extensions. I certainly understand, I think it was one of your projects where you were finishing tenant space up, so you needed a time extension. And I think there was, that we've done some others where the project is underway, and so the idea that we wouldn't grant the extension for something that was literally happening seems a little foolish. I mean, not really logical um, but these haven't started yet and I certainly appreciate and this is a question for staff is it practice or policy or is it in the regulations that we typically do one year from the date of approval I can't remember for completion it's a standard condition of all approvals because it um, is the same amount of time in which a building permit is um, ballot. One year. Except we often give ours before the building permit. 
We should give ours before the building permit. Right, but, but what I'm saying is we can give approval, but they could not ask for a building permit for another 6 to 18 months. Correct. So they're the time... Yeah, they don't... Hopefully we're fixing that. I mean, in an ideal version. world, when they get approval here, they should... Their plans should be in the format that they would go get a permit. So that's why that 12 months is the standard condition, because it lasts as long as a building permit. So. And our, our uh, recommendation is to um, stick with precedent, um, absent, and that's why we've asked the applicant to come here. Uh, if when we deviate from precedent, we should justify that. So we, that's why we're asking for just so. So just our practice is to be consistent with the life of a building permit, even though we issue ours a certain amount of time before the building permit might be issued. Yes. We, we could be off from days and weeks to apparently years um, if they don't draw a building permit for a while. Yes. Okay. Um, but all of that said, I think the difficulty for, I don't think, the difficulty for me is that these are not projects that have started yet. And unless you're about to tell us that they're going to start within six to eight months or nine months, you could be back here in five years saying that the climate wasn't right, so we need yet another extension. Um, and at that point, well, at that point, we would be eight years from the first time we gave an approval. And that, to me, seems sure. incredibly long because there are too many variables that could change sure. the community that might say, in five to eight years, maybe just this just wasn't the right project. I'm not saying that specific to you. No, I'm just saying that no, the time frame is such that so many things can happen. Sure. Um, so for me, it, it's an issue that basically we're not dealing with somebody who's underway and just needs a little more time to complete something. And there's obviously no guarantee of when something would start. So I, I question how long we want to just keep pushing the envelope out where in 2020 we're already four years we're about to be four years from the date we first granted approval so and in this in the first case it would be again allowing a window of eight years from the time of approval and the other three are six years so I I have concerns about that so that's just for this end of the room to understand in terms of where my head is at I think two things if I may comment or did you want to talk next you know, I know that, for instance, um, the Iron Pier building's on the fourth extension. It did take us, um, I think, almost a year to get a building permit, and it's not because we didn't apply. So, you know, there are factors that don't make any sense as far as um, a year and a, a year building permit. I do remember asking for a longer time on the, because um, the buildings take two years to build. Absolutely. So, so I do remember that, and, and that was, that's the way your ordinance, your, your resolutions work. So we're working within that framework. Um, I guess what I, I don't, I, I'm thinking, you know, this one extension we've asked for, if it were, say we came in when we, were, when we, say it was approved when it was requested, it would be expiring in March for most of these. They were all requested around the same time. They would be expiring March of 2020. Mm -hmm. So what I'm thinking is, given your concern, would it make sense to say, okay, we granted that one to March 20 and ask for one more year? Because that's essentially where you'd be if I went out and applied for another approval from this and got it, and I'd get another year. Because people come in here and they're going to say, I have this and I want to do that. They may not. I mean, there's no guarantee they're going to build right. it. You know, the, the guarantee is that I've invested $2 million and I don't want to waste it and I... I need to develop it um, so and I think if somebody were saying um, or, or you know I could see I see your eight-year point I mean I totally it makes sense when you put it in four versus eight but what about you know the fact that maybe it's maybe it's the rest of this request to get us to March and one more year does that I know that's five five and a half years six years but um, I think that's not out of the question for a, a buildings of this size in this area, which is extremely unique. It's not SU. It's not um, even a hospital area. You know, the, the St. Joe's. It's it's a very unique area, and there was contamination there, and there was you know a, a lot of nothing, berms and and 
dangerous parks that that are now cleaned up that um, I do think that you know this I think we're trying to operate in a framework that limits these one 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 years when it sounds ter it sounds like a long time but but it's I think you're seeing this slow generation of of activity and development and it it is going to take some time. That's so we start with one year requests that doesn't make sense because I don't have a, a tenant and a plan to build it, but if I ask for longer, that's too long. It doesn't make sense. So is there somewhere in between that makes sense for, from your angle? Well, I also think we have to consider that and, and someone on that table can respond to this. Um, we could certainly deny an extension and I assume the terminology would be like we deny it without prejudice, which means they could come back with the virtual same project again, like you said, and we'd start the clock all over again. Um, but that that gives not only the community an option to reconsider, it gives you an option to reconsider as well. Um, clearly the biggest problem is that the time frame doesn't have a lot to do with construction and development. Right. In spite of the fact that a building permit is good for a year and, and how people plan these projects. Um, but again, I guess for me there's a there's a point at which how how long how long is everyone in limbo? Right. Waiting for the market forces to be right. But but uh, I guess I understand that, but so you say it's a comeback in a year, that's what that's the way your system's designed to grant extensions every year. And, and if there is a reason when that extension comes up in a, in a year and two months from now, then you can say no if there's another extension. Whereas, whereas if you, I, I mean, I can say putting it out five years, no, I, I might, something might change in that five year period. I, that, I understand that. I was just trying to re be responsive. No, and I understand. So, so I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to be, Get no, what no, I no, get no. here, you know. I understand the question. So, yeah, so, so yeah, so I guess my thinking is, there is nothing right now that I'm aware of that's um, changed or creates a. Ooh, I don't think we want that mixed-use building there. Um, so why not? What's the harm of saying, "Yep, we're going to grant this one extension and one more year," which takes us to March? So I don't bother you all at 8.30 at night on, in two months from now, and um, we have another year, and then you can say, okay, you know what, things have changed, or something developed and this doesn't fit, or, you know, whatever the changes are. And I think that's the way your system was set up, to do these one-year blocks to allow you to say no because something's changed. I don't think it was designed that way because four years is a lot, six years is kind of a lot and eight years is too many. I don't I think it was more it gives us the control to, to, to do what you're talking about. So if if we're to do that, um, I mean I'm okay with that. I I'm really just asking for a, a one year that would have been granted a year ago or in last January, I think. No, last March. Um, and then one more year behind that so you're at this would expire now or one more in addition to that in March of twenty one. So for the first one I have open, which is 1604, we okay. approved a time extension in April 18 that brought us to Mine says this March 19. Expired right. March 28, 2019. That's, that's the date that the approval expired according to the paperwork that I had. Now, 1604, right? Yeah. Okay, so I have... The initial approval was March 2016, which would have been completion in March 2017. Then there was a zoning administrator approval to extend it yep, to March one. 2018. Yep. And then the planning commission extended it. That's weird. Wait, we went from March 2018 to April? We only extended it a month? No. Mine says March. It says we approved the second request on April 23rd, 2018. It doesn't say until when. That's the date of the action. That's not the date of the extension, I had it right? March 28, 19. It expired. It would kind of make sense. Okay, that's what meant. Uh, okay. And then we will request January. And then we requested it January 30, 19, 
you know, ahead of the expiration of March 28, 19. So it, let's just say it's March and we don't know the exact date, but March 2019, I would ask that it go to March 2020 and then ask for another year to get it to March 2021. That's what I'm asking. Or at least I think that's a reasonable request here. You see where that is? And here. Yes, and I apologize for the terrible uh, communication, <laughs> but the last approval uh, for an extension was on April 23rd, 2018, uh, to grant an extension through March 28th, 2019. Okay. So the, I, I the would. March month is the correct. Yeah. Okay. There, there, I mean, I have it's the right you have. Just, Yeah, I know. You're, you're looking at Yeah, things. I get it. So I would agree. It'd be silly to grant you an extension that brought us from last March up until this March. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, and I guess I, again, to my colleagues, I would feel more comfortable sticking with the rules and saying, Here's a years long extension, at which point we revisit. And at that point, it's, it's again, there's a still a substantial amount of time that's gone by if we don't want to grapple with that right now tonight. But but I I tend to agree that the year long reviews give us a sense of <laughs> keeping on top of things. And maybe we don't have that discussion tonight that four years have gone by and nothing's happened, do we want to push it out one more year and then make a harder decision arbitrarily at five years? Um, I, I just know I would be uncomfortable with a five-year extension. And, and proportionately so for the other three. So I'm just going to seize the moment here. And I yes. think I'm hearing, and maybe just we move through these one at a time, but since we're on the very first one, the 1604, uh, and I'm hearing some support for an extension through March of 2021, whatever the appropriate date in March would be. Is there yes. some consensus. acquiescence around that? And yes. if that's the case, um, is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? So on 1604, we have a new deadline of March, whatever the math 28. it's going to be, of 2021. So that brings us to closure on that one. The other two had smaller uh, requests, but let's work through those one at a time. So 1605 was Spencer Street. That let me just I'll just I'll, the approval expired March 16th, 2019. March was a big year, and um, month, not year. Um, <laughs> we requested the extension last January as well. Um, this is for a, there was a, there's an existing parking lot on Spencer Street. This was to um, modify that existing parking lot um, and make it meet your zoning ordinance with lighting, landscaping, stormwater, et cetera. It is tied to the element and the solar street piece as as parking off site so there's parking on site but the extra needed parking is on there um, so those it was tied like i said to the element and to the next request which is a mixed use solar street building um, very similarly um, you know don't have a tenant we did have a tenant um, and they ultimately didn't end up there so um, we are marketing this. We have had a lot of interest in it. Um, I don't have. I, it's. I don't have. Um, I'm not ready to pull, pull a building permit. Smaller building, though. I think it. You know, it, it, it has more apt. More apt to be constructed more quickly than the element. Um, you know, I requested three years um, for the parking lot as well as to tie into the Solar Street building and its associated promenade improvements, which is the next one. So, um, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole song and dance again on that, but it's, it's the same uh, issue. Using the logic we did on the previous one, what a March 16, 2021 deadline makes sense in this case. Is so moved. Okay. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Say nay. Any abstentions? 
these. Uh, so 16-11, Solar Street. What's her? Uh, I would make the same motion. Okay. Yeah, this one has a different date for. Um, August. Yeah, it's August. So I would ask the same thing for August 21. Sure. Thank you. And it, and that actually is for both. They're both 16-10 and 11 are exactly the same dates. Okay. okay. No problem. Okay. So they're adjoined. Motion on that. Yep. So moved to August of 2021. Second, I think I heard. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 No opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? And then the related one, 16-10, same address. And same motion to okay. extend to August of 2021. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Okay, one, two, three, four. We've got one year ish. One year ish. Hopefully, the next time I come back asking for the extension, there will be a building permit in place. Mm -hmm. like, thank you very much. I've been cutting them. <laughs> um, just for staff, and I know there was a moment in time where I pretty much had memorized the rezone draft, and of course, I don't remember any of it right this second. Um, but in the infamous yet to be developed, administrative manual it would seem at a minimum if it's not a part of the regulations this is the kind of thing that we would address like what are the checkpoints for when we need to deliberate about an extension what direction should we be giving an applicant regarding what would justify us granting an extension I know you don't want me to say at this hour of the night but it should that be in the a, administrative manual at a minimum. That is a good idea. I'm speaking of, we do have a correspondence from regarding that. <laughs> a little segue. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have that? Yes. So this is a, uh, well, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is pertaining to uh, the draft. Seeker sto um, scoping document, and as a reminder, the um, any interested party and members of the public have until Friday, January seventeenth. That's this week um, to comment on the draft scoping document. Um, we did have a meeting uh, last week where co comments from the public were taken. Um, the, those comments can be submitted online and. Um, Basically, it's the uh, city's intent through the Common Council to prepare a draft generic environmental inset or impact statement after the comments have been uh, reviewed for the scoping document. Uh, do you have any questions or concerns at this point? The, the scoping document is basically the roadmap for how the, the, yes. the draft ordinance will be reviewed. Uh, it's the roadmap for the um, draft generic environmental in impact statement and that it highlights what we anticipate are the environmental impacts mm -hmm. and um, then uh, members of the public can comment on that and then after that we can move into the full um, mm -hmm. the more comprehensive environmental review so, um, talking about a separate document so this the scoping document basically says we have this draft ordinance and we generally think these are the impacts that would result from the adoption of it does the general public agree with us that these are the general impacts and the general public can say oh my goodness you left out this whole category or we think this is spot on um, and so then the actual draft is evaluated based on those things we thought might be impacts. Yes. Okay, but your earlier point was about a manual. So in the draft ordinance, both versions of it, so the earlier versions and then the adoption draft, there is constant mention of an administrative manual to the point that an applicant should fill out all the new applications based on the advice in the administrative manual. So as we're about to go through this review and theoretically approval process, there is no administrative manual that would be adopted on the exact same day as the ordinance. 
what would we do then? I have raised that question, and some folks oh. said, Quim, we should think about that. Cla mm. Clarion is working with us and um, preparing that document. I don't believe it's has beyond choosing sort of the formatting and what I don't think we've met much after uh, after that. And I am certainly of the opinion that whenever precedent you know is existing it should be written down somewhere because it's I mean you can have precedent that's not written down and it's still strong evidence mm -hmm. of legal precedent but it's always nice to have it written down and codified somewhere um, so that people know mm -hmm. what the procedures so are reference mm -hmm. yes I think particularly since it was the, this new manual was referred to several times as providing mm -hmm. the applicant with assistance it, it, it has to be available the day that the ordinance goes into effect because how else, where else would the applicants get the assistance? It puts an incredible amount of burden on the staff, which I don't think makes sense. Um, and I think it also was going to be useful for us because we can refer to it in right. deliberations, right. like the last couple of cases. That Definitely. We about, so. But the immediate issue is here are all the things that we think might be, might be the, the likely impacts if we adopt this document. And so now we all get to, the public gets to say whether or not that's the full scope of in, impacts that should be evaluated. And that's why we got this, right? <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. More discussion on this topic or questions? <laughs> Thank you, he says. <laughs> However, we have a couple more items of business. We have correspondence from. Uh, oh, that was it. That was it. It was okay. So we. There's no specific action required of us at this time. No, if you want to submit comments, I think they're due. Have until to the end of the week. Office. The letter. Okay. The letter has the email address too that you can submit them to. Oh right, you said they're possible to, uh, to do it online. Friday the 17th. Then we have authorizations for our next meeting. We have four new cases. Oh, there it is. Uh, plus the one we reopened for tonight on Erie Boulevard because of, at a minimum, ambiguity, but maybe misunderstanding of what was going on there, SP-20-03. Anything else to add to the authorizations for February 3rd? In that case, is there a motion to authorize those cases? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 As opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Uh, that is it. Anything else to come before? The commission this evening, other than a motion to adjourn. Oops. Last comment. I believe that January seventh um, public meeting was on YouTube. Uh, it should have been recorded, so it it should be available if you oh, want to listen to people. Oh, good. Comments. Thank you for that. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, okay. Now a motion to adjourn. Yes. <laughs> Discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 As opposed, say nay. And since we're adjourned, we return on the 3rd of February, three weeks now. Okay. I thought it was going to be a quick agenda. <laughs> <laughs>